The Zombie Apocalypse Has Begun. Written by Cat the Kickass on r slash no sleep. Each night I have to put my son down. He's five now, but he won't go to sleep without me. Every night I have to walk him to bed, read him a story, and kiss him goodnight. Each time I close the door, I pray he won't wake up. Don't get me wrong, I love him. I love him so much more than I ever thought possible before he was born. But when I saw him, when I held him, I fell in love. And I would do anything to protect him. Which is why I wish he wouldn't wake up. If he just slept, slept forever and ever, that he wouldn't have to see tomorrow. See the future. I've seen it. Seen it in his dull eyes, and the corpses and the blood in the streets. And I know, I know he will not survive. He will be destroyed, be ended, or become the monster. Because the zombie apocalypse has begun. It has begun in my town. My town of less than 3,000 people. And it won't end here. It will spread. It has already spread to the surrounding towns, to the nearest cities. While the world hasn't been hit yet, maybe the world doesn't even know yet, it will. It will know so, so soon. But for now, it is here. And for now, I fear for my son. I fear for him and my wife and our daughter. Each night, I stay awake in the living room, listening to the thumps and claws and screams outside. I sit with my gun and my baseball bat. Cliché, I know. But I have nothing else. I didn't quite plan for the end of the world. Sorry. Each night, I fall asleep when the sun rises. It scares me when that happens, but I can't stay awake longer. And they don't move in the sun, thankfully. I'm not sure why. I don't know if they burn like a vampire, if they just can't move or can't think. I just know they do not move in the sun, and that when I watch out the window as the sun starts creeping out, they all flee. Not that we go outside in the sun either. While safe, it's not perfect. Stepping into a shadow is like taking your life in your own hands. And nobody wants to risk that in case one of them is brave. That they're trying to lure us out. And so we stay in the dark like them. I sleep all day. Though I know my wife and daughter are awake. They sleep all night. Afraid of the screams and the terror in the dark. My son sleeps with me, though. Though I put him to rest at night. Shortly after dawn each day he awakens me only to crawl into my arms and sleep beside me. How he is so tired I do not understand, but I will not question his love. I only fear for the women in my life, so afraid of everything that they rarely even come downstairs. Sometimes I'm afraid they're sick, afraid the screams in the dark are theirs, and that I will not know better, that I will wake up and see blood on them. I'm afraid it will belong to my son. But they aren't, and they won't be. Because I will protect us in the dark. As my body rots and my desire for their flesh grows stronger, I will lay my son into his grave each night, and we will survive. I think I'm undead. Help? Written by Sort of Haunted on r slash no sleep. I've been eating a lot of raw meat lately. It started out as a sushi craving. But then I ended up gnawing on raw steaks while sitting on my couch watching Netflix. I mean, maybe I needed the protein. I guess it started when I woke up in the morgue. So maybe it's trauma of some sort. Of course, there's nothing more horrifying than waking up in a metal drawer, realizing where you are, and immediately launching into the panic attack of a lifetime. Thankfully, the morgue attendant opened the drawer with wide eyes, babbling about how sorry he was, or some shit. I'm thinking about suing the hospital, but hey, we only get one life, I think. The weirdest part was seeing my death certificate. There's my name, Tabris. Yeah, weird name I know, but what can I say? My mom liked angels, and it freaked me the hell out. Apparently, I had been found dead in an alley, 
until, of course, I woke up in the morgue. The doctors had no way of explaining it, because they didn't want to admit they fucked up and declared a living person dead. They wanted to run a bunch of tests on me. Fuck that. I'm not their guinea pig. I hate needles anyway. Couldn't focus at work anymore, when the whole eating raw meat thing started to freak some people out. Also, being deathly pale doesn't help. Also, my blood pressure is incredibly low, so I'm crazy lethargic. I quit, deciding to do some freelance writing and consulting. The nightmares didn't help. I kept dreaming I was waking up in this insanely creepy operating room, complete with surgeon with a bloody gown. The dream always ends with him leaning over and putting a mask over my mouth. Police scanners aren't actually that difficult to set up. I did it mostly out of a boredom, figuring I might as well do something with my time. I like listening to them, hearing about all the various crimes growing on in the area. One night, around 2 a.m., I pretty much stopped sleeping too, I heard something particularly interesting. Immediate response needed to shots fired on 13th Street. Dispatch crackled. I scooched closer to my scanner, interested. 13th Street wasn't far from here. We'll be right there, a cop responded. A few minutes later, he was requesting backup. We got a dead body. Need a bus. The officer's voice crackled over the radio. I sighed. I never liked hearing that. I hated the idea of anyone ending up in that hell morgue I woke up in. Officer down. Repeat. Officer down. Suspect fleeing on foot. He said, shouting the radio. Suspect is a white male in his 50s, armed and dangerous. He just shot my fucking partner. I sat up suddenly. For the first time in months, I knew what I had to do. I pulled on a black hoodie. I left my apartment, locking the door. I went downstairs and out on the sidewalk, listening to the increasing sounds of sirens. The weird thing about me now, post-mortem, is I have an incredible sense of smell. Gunpowder has a very distinct smell, like firecrackers, and I could smell it the second I stepped onto the street. I turned to my left, the opposite direction of the sirens, and the scent got stronger. I sprinted down the street. Another advantage of my new condition. I'm incredibly fast, and don't get tired. Makes going to the gym a lot more fun. But this wasn't the gym. I was on the tail of a stone-cold killer. So I guess the gym but more escape room style, but also real life. Next thing I knew, I saw a shadowy figure duck into one of the many backyards of the houses around here. Deadly silent, I followed. I walked up behind him. He was trying to jimmy open the back door of the house when I grabbed him. Hey! He shouted, struggling against my grip. I slammed him to the side of the house. Well, 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 what are we here? I said, feeling an evil smile creep across my face. He was a gross looking dude with weak old stubble and an unpleasant smell. It was nowhere near being strong enough to fight me off. What the hell, bitch? Let me go! He shouted at me, spitting in my face. Now see, I don't like murderers. Specifically men. They have this tendency to kill people who did nothing to them, and to call women bitches when they really fucking shouldn't. I crushed his windpipe, then his spine. He died instantly. Honestly, I always hated those articles about ethical cannibalism or some shit. I read one about a guy who made tacos out of his severed foot. I never wanted to eat human flesh, mostly because of Wendigo concerns. So believe me when I say I couldn't control myself. I ripped him apart, chopping as I went. I even ate his brain, cracking his skull open like an egg. Guess that makes me a zombie? I cleaned up best I could. I felt bad for eating this guy in the backyard of some perfectly nice family. I dragged what was left of him into the streets for the cop to find. I even called an anonymous tip, and I walked home to do some laundry. The next day, the paper ran a story about it. The cops were baffled as to how they were, could be chasing this guy one second, only to find him ripped to pieces down the street the next. Apparently, the man's name was Stan, and had murdered his wife after abusing her for two decades. Honestly, the only thing I felt bad about was not killing him sooner. Maybe I make a habit of this. Tonight's story is called... I accidentally started a zombie apocalypse, written by Dretchino on r slash no sleep. It all started when my dog died. Let's call him George. George had been my best buddy ever since I'd been 12. And as you can imagine, his passing away left a deep hole in my heart, even bigger than the one I had dug out in my backyard to bury him. However, as people say, I was sure that one day 
I would move on from it. It was just that this process was taking far longer than I had thought. I still found it hard to get up in the morning, and I still found it hard to believe that I would never hear George's footsteps as he bounded into the house. I used to hate how he would always make a mess walking in, but now, I wanted nothing more than for him to walk in and tear the furniture to pieces one more time. In my grief, my sleeping pattern was pretty messed up. I ended up taking a nap that afternoon that lasted well into the evening, and as you can imagine, I really didn't feel like sleeping later on at night. I decided that maybe taking a walk would clear my mind a little. I didn't want to be in my house as it brought back memories of George. George and I usually go and take a walk in the nearby park, so I went on another route. This one ended up leading through the cemetery, which is a bit unnerving, but I didn't want to turn back at that point. It was during this walk that I saw something I wasn't expecting. A large group of people gathered around in a circle off in the distance. At first, I thought it might be the local parent-teacher association, the PTA, meeting coming together. Now that I look back on what I saw, that seems unlikely. After all, all these people were wearing strange black cloaks and had their weird ornament around their necks. They were wearing masks. Nothing weird about this in these times, but these completely hid their faces. They were also holding knives and one of them was tied up and gagged. Not to mention, why would the PTA meet outside the school? And in a cemetery near midnight? Yeah, they probably weren't the PTA, but I hadn't pieced that out that time. So, I decided to walk up them and say, hello, thinking that some conversation might take my mind off things. One of them saw me approach and screamed, we've been found, run! All at once, the gathered people scrambled away in random directions, even taking the man who had been tied up with them. I was rather upset, as you can understand, that these people were avoiding me. How rude do you have to be to run away right when you see someone? Anyway, I noticed something on the ground. It appeared that these people had dropped something in their hurry to get away from me. It was a rather thick book with a title written in a language whose letters I didn't recognize, so I assumed that it might have been in French. I had taken Spanish in school, you see, so I had no knowledge of French. Now, these people might have been rude to me, but I figured I should still return the book to them. The only thing I didn't know who any of these people were, and the book didn't have any owner mentioned on the cover. While it is definitely not a nice thing to go through someone else's belongings, this could have been someone's diary for all I knew. I did want to return it to its owner and had no clue as to who that was, and so I began reading it. The text inside was also in this strange language, but someone had scribbled out what I guessed were the translations in English. The handwriting even seemed a little familiar, but I chose to ignore it at the moment, as my attention got to a page about something called necromancy. Apparently, it was possible to bring back to life someone, or something, as a zombie. It immediately piqued my interest, as it meant that I might be able to see George again. I decided that I could hold back on giving the book back. I wanted to see if it was possible to bring back my dog first. I was sure whoever owned the book didn't need it back urgently or anything. Of course, I wanted to be sure about what I was doing first. I called my local veterinarian's office the next morning to ask about his medical opinion on bringing back an animal with dark magic, but I was swiftly disconnected. Sadly, both the World Health Organization and the CDC didn't have any information on this, so I just decided to go ahead with it. Now. The whole thing required some ingredients, which I couldn't exactly find on Amazon or even eBay, so it took some time to gather them together. When I was done, and the next new moon rolled around, I stood outside George's grave and read out the incantations written in the book, after I placed the reagents over the grave. At first, nothing happened, so I was kind of disappointed. But then I heard something. It sounded like muffled scratching beneath the earth. I began clearing it off and eventually came upon a wriggling paw. A while later, and I had unearthed George. He was a bit decomposed, but surprisingly, he didn't smell at all. He barked happily as he saw me, and I saw recognition in his eyes. Yeah, there were a couple of issues. For one, George seemed to reject everything that I wanted to feed him. He was undead, so I wasn't sure if that was an issue. Secondly, he was a lot more aggressive, at times trying to bite my hand. He never succeeded, though. But. I just thought this aggression was a side effect of having been buried. After all, I think it'd be a bit cranky too if I was buried underground for a few weeks. 
I decided to ignore these small flaws and instead spend as much time as I wanted with George. I can't describe to you how amazing it was to finally be with him after having lost him. It felt as if I was whole again. Aside from a few violent outbursts, he was just as playful as he had always been. While it was nice to play around with George, I remembered the book and the fact that I was supposed to return it. See, I had said that I sort of recognized the handwriting. I thought it belonged to my neighbor, who I'll call Johnny. And so I showed up at his house holding the book. Here, John, I think you dropped this, I said. Immediately, his face turned to one of shock and he vehemently denied owning it. But this is your handwriting, right? I pointed out. He said no. It must be some mistake, and that I should just take the book away and leave. He kept looking around frantically as if afraid that someone might be watching us. All right, if you don't want it. I then paused. But I should thank you for this. I mean, I managed to get my dog back thanks for this. His eyes widened as I explained what I had done, and he began to freak out even more asking to see my dog. I complied. After all, John had played with George before. I took John to visit George, and John began to freak out for some reason. I thought he'd be happy to see George again, but he didn't seem to share my joy at having my pet back. I think this is what set George off, because he's normally such a friendly dog, but he went ahead and bit John on the leg. It was a shallow bite, and I offered to wash it with soap and water before driving him to get a rabies shot. John just sprinted away at that point, and I had to hold George back to prevent him from attacking John. I got that John was kind of rude to George, but still, I didn't want my dog to hurt John anymore. The next day I got a call from John's number, but it was from his wife. Let's call her Jane. She told me that John had been acting weird ever since he had come back to me to see George, and she was asking if he had taken drugs or something. I asked her what he was doing that was so weird, and she said that his skin was now grayer and had bitten her last night in bed. I told her I thought that was kind of kinky and not what I would be comfortable with, but if that was what the two of them wanted to do, I had no real business judging them for it. For some reason, she got frustrated when I said this, and she hung up on me. Things have gotten progressively weirder over the weeks since then, guys. My town has been in lockdown for the past three days. I thought it was the virus that has been going around the world lately, but it seems to be something different. People have been whispering about zombies, but they're hushed up now that the military has been involved and has stationed troops here. I hear gunshots occasionally throughout the day, and so I had to move George inside since he gets agitated easily by loud sounds. I won't lie, I'm getting kind of scared now. I haven't heard from John or Jane for a couple days, and they aren't picking up their phone. I can't help but feel that somehow, I might be responsible for all that's happening. But even if there is a zombie apocalypse, all zombies can't be bad, right? I mean, George is one, and he seems to be fine for the most part. I really hope the military doesn't feel like they have to take George away. That's what scares me the most. I can't stand losing him for a second time. What do you guys think I should do? Please answer quickly. I think they might cut off our internet, and I'd like some advice before they do. I'm not going to lie, this story sounds like one of my kids <laughs> decided to go for a walk in the woods and it just forest gumped their way through an entire day <laughs> like it's it's just so crazy to think I, I was flipping through some of the the, um, the comments and the, the PTA and the woods thing was so strange it, it was I get that it's supposed to be I don't know maybe the, the author is going for humor but it just seems so strange to think that a PTA meeting would be up in the woods it'd be strange to think that uh, I mean this is basically pet cemetery but the idea that Pep Cemetery could be turned into like a zombie apocalypse kind of thing. You know? Yeah, very strange. Very strange story. Um, but for all the kind of crappy, bad stories, you can appreciate some of the better ones. So you, you need like some kind of schlock, some kind of crap in order to uh, have a, a solid horror ecosystem. So. I'll, I'll take any story, good or bad. <laughs> so I hope you guys enjoyed the story. I did, even though I kind of crapped on it. I didn't mean to. It, the story was fun to read. but And who doesn't love dogs? So I'd, I'd probably bring my dog back, too. Um, and say, damn to the zombie apocalypse. Who cares? I got my puppy back. But I hope you enjoyed the story. I'll talk to you guys later. And uh, remember to always face your fears. Do You Believe in Zombies by... 
Aizanagi the God on r slash no sleep. Do you believe in zombies? Of course you don't. You are no fool. But I recommend you trust me and hear me out. This is both a warning and a lesson for humanity. The concept of zombies has been twisted and reformed over the decades, with slow-moving vessels of flesh to infected and enraged individuals who seek blood. But one that has really been touched upon is the more subtle definition. The art of one becoming brain dead. No desires, no needs. Taking away what makes one human. Why do I bring this up? Because it is very real. Over a decade ago, a small organization had a thought. One that has surely passed the minds of other people who wish to cause chaos. But the difference is that these specific people struck the fine balance between brilliant and psychotic required to actually attempt it. And succeed for that matter. How, you ask? Well, putting years worth of extensive experiments into a couple paragraphs wouldn't quite do it justice. But one word does come to mind when describing it. Hypnosis. The first thought in your head is probably an eccentric old bat with a metronome and pocket watch. But it goes far beyond that. It is an art form more than it's a gimmick. And there are those who have practiced this their entire lives, who made this dream a reality. It took a very short amount of time, but the first ten victims were under control of this group, to where they could essentially turn the person off and on, brain dead or their normal self. The thing about being brain dead is that losing your needs means you simply don't care for the vital things needed for survival. Ironically, being the opposite of zombies we're used to, food and water are lost in your mind and you will die a slow and painful death without ever knowing why. The strongest weapon a terrorist group could ever have. Why shoot and bomb the enemy when we let them kill themselves? Not with violence, but with the lack of functionality to survive. They had these ten initial victims, but the trick was how to spread it. That's where the brilliance really shined. After years of perfecting it, they managed to pass on the hypnotism with the victim in a very delicate way. By having someone believe that the hypnotized was not only a real person, but actually growing emotional bonds to that person. This caused the hypnotism to pass along, almost as if accepting the zombies as a real human being was accepting the hypnotism itself. Don't ask me exactly how it works, for I don't know, nor do I care. I'm far more focused on my safety along with all of yours. They had over 14,000 under their control until someone managed to find them out whether it was a mole or someone who was too terrified of what they created. Luckily, each victim's name and location was filed in the organization's database, so various governments from different nations managed to find and round up each and every one of them in complete secrecy, kidnapping them from their families or workplaces, aside from just a few who managed to escape. You see, the trick to all of it is that over time they perfected their technique. At the very beginning, you had to feel something strong, such as love for zombie, until the hypnotism was passed along to you. But as the years went on, they got very good at what they do. Simple emotions such as hatred, jealousy, and most useful of all, trust. You may think to yourself, why trust? Nobody trusts each other anymore since everyone is so selfish. But when the crying five-year-old child comes to you with battered clothes saying that daddy hit mommy again, but she stopped moving this time, not only do you trust what this child is saying, You feel a personal obligation to help him not only find a safe place, but to make sure he never sees that horror again. You feel for it, and now you're a victim. But we've evolved since then. Even now, the amount of trust can be so small before you join us. Like believing that I'm actually a human. Believing that I'm trying to help you. Coming into this specific subreddit with the belief that each story holds a semblance of truth to it. You considered me being normal a truth and you've long been one of us since that some conscious thought formed in your head. I feel no different, just a guy writing a story to get in my head. But that's the magic of it. You won't feel different until we decide that your country needs to disappear. Because remember, you don't believe in zombies. And that's our greatest strength. I was trying to stop the zombie apocalypse, not start it, by N.S. Lewis from r slash no sleep. I'm trying not to panic, but it's hard because purple slime has been slowly oozing out of my eyeballs for the past hour, searing my cheeks like acid. My name is Brendan Pierce, 
and I've either just saved the world or doomed it. The horrible ocular discharge could, after all, be merely a side effect of the vaccine, like a slight fever after a flu shot. Or it could be a sign that I'm infected with a supercharged version of the virus of my own making that turned my best friend into a puddle of bubbling slime. Aaron's horrific death was also my doing. I thought it'd be funny to make him eat some tainted cantaloupe. I just thought it would taste bad, because it smelled so awful, like meat left out for weeks, crawling like a parasitic worm. I guess now that I write it out like that, I should have known. I should have known that Aaron's belly would have become distended as his, his organs and then bones melted away from the inside until the pressure built so much that his stomach burst open and it poured all over onto the floor. If I could go back in time, there's so much I'd change. The cantaloupe thing for starters. I'd also try to convince my former boss that his quest for a formula to make unperishable bananas, while certainly a cool idea, was not worth creating a super virus with the potential to wipe out humanity. And I'd also change everything I did after Aaron's death. If I could go back in time, but I can't change the past. I can only recount it. And now, as the slime starts to ooze out of my nose and burns my lips, I have to admit that I have screwed up on a global scale. And I don't have much time to tell you that I have doomed humanity for the worst death imaginable. Maybe somebody will be able to do something to save the world. But, as small insects dripping in a purple slime start to push their way out of the pores of my arm, I know that it's not going to be me. After Aaron's death, I had a breakdown. I became convinced that the virus had been unwittingly created in the lab, was going to spread throughout the world and affect everyone on the planet. I couldn't sleep. I had waking nightmares. Visions of standing in a crowded street as everyone around me became brain-dead zombies and slowly turned to face me without stretched arms. Then they started popping, like grotesque pimples, overripe with the deadly virus. Visions of men eating the flesh of men, of scorched earth, of rotten bananas, all swirling around in my head as a ballet of death and terror. I had to do something. I had to stop my nightmares from coming true. I still had my notes in the lab where the terrible thing was spawned. I used those notes to carefully recreate the virus in a makeshift lab that I set up in my basement in the hopes of being able to use it as a vaccine. I went... I now understand. Overboard. Rather than creating a small batch of the virus, I made enough serum to fill dozens of empty industrial waste drums. I was convinced that the world was in peril, and I needed enough vaccine to protect everyone. Still, I decided to experiment on the vaccine itself before I tampered with the bulk of the deadly serum. My first attempt to make the vaccine was to use radiation to kill the active agents in the virus. I'll admit that I didn't know exactly what the active agents were, but I figured that radiation would certainly kill them. As it turns out, I was terribly wrong. But at the time, I thought I was right. And so I made up enough vaccine to fill a large syringe, which I carried with me everywhere I went, waiting for the perfect opportunity. I knew that if I just kept my eyes open long enough, I would find somebody infected with the virus. I knew that it had already started to spread throughout the world, and that only I could stop it. And sure enough, one day while I was waiting at a subway stop, I saw somebody spontaneously explode in a woman, an unmistakable symptom of the virus. I never got a good opportunity to inject this woman with a potential vaccine, as a team of dangerous looking people in hazmat suits swooped in and sent me running. But I did follow her and watch her have lunch with her secret boyfriend. I could also see the virus being transmitted across the lunch table from the woman to the man, so I followed him home and snuck up behind him. I was terrified myself as I jammed the needle in the side of his head and then ducked around behind a car. He looked around in confusion, no doubt wondering why the hell there was suddenly a stabbing pain in his brain. But it worked, and after standing dumbfounded for a few moments, he went inside. Now all I had to do was observe him for a bit and make sure that he didn't show any symptoms of the virus. I climbed up a tree and watched him through a window of his apartment. Things did not proceed as I hoped. The man's fingers began to grow into different bizarre items. Like pencils that you could see trying to poke through a translucent layer of skin. The man's actual girlfriend kept cutting those weird fingers off, but they kept growing back. Now his keys, 
I was baseball bats. I was horrified by what I was seeing, and by the knowledge that rather than curing the man of virus, I had simply mutated into something even more terrible. Radiating the virus is not advised. I wrote that down in my notebook. The nightmares didn't stop. My initial failure to create a vaccine was discouraging, but the sense of urgency to succeed grew greater and greater as I went further and further off the deep end. I stayed inside for days on end, talking to myself, berating myself for failing. I kept working. If radiation didn't kill the active agent of the virus, then maybe heat would. So I set to work, boiling a sample of serum with scorching heat until I was sure that the active agent was dead. There were warning signs that I ignored. The vaccine wouldn't stop bubbling, for instance, even after it had been stored in a deep freezer overnight. Somewhere along the line, the guilt and terror became too much for my psyche to bear, and I so became the chosen one. I felt my brain crackle with electric energy and became convinced that I was destined to save humanity and that there was no possibility of failure. Thinking back, I am horrified at how completely I broke with reality, but at the time, it was a defense mechanism to keep me going through the constant nightmares. I realized it was impractical for me to go around injecting everyone with a new vaccine myself. It would be much better if I could infuse it into objects that would transmit it through people's skin on contact. Then I could send the object out into the world in bulk. I settled on a necklace. I boiled the necklace in the vaccine until all the solution was gone from the pot and infused in the necklace. Then, I carefully packaged up the necklace. I never touched it directly myself, of course, just in case. After all, I thought I was the chosen one and way too important to lose. I set the package in a random one's stoop and settled into some bushes to observe. And what I observed was so terrible that the horror began to seep through the cracks of my invented ego. The woman went inside and put on the necklace. The necklace began acting strange, and the woman began acting stranger. I told myself that it was just harmless side effects of the vaccine. But when the woman took the first bite out of her boyfriend's heart, I had to look away or risk giving in to total despair. Heating the virus is not advised. I wrote that in my notebook. I have been experimenting with different chemical cocktails that might render the serum from a deadly virus into a world-saving vaccine. This time, I decided to experiment on mice instead of men. Each time a mouse exploded, I felt more and more sure that I was destined to save the world. Looking back now, when understanding has come too late, it's clear I had lost my mind almost entirely. The event that made me lose my mind 100% all the way happened when I was driving back from the store with more supplies. I was driving down a street in the suburb when I saw a very bizarre sight. A man was going around and mowing a lawn that had already been mowed as four uniformed police officers also performed redundant landscaping tasks. I felt a renewed sense of terror as I pulled off to the side of the road to observe. This is it, I thought. It's happening. A tan car came screeching down the road and went barreling through the yard that was getting excessively manicured. The car crashed into an apple tree, and a woman in a gas mask and plastic poncho jumped out of it. She pulled out a large blaster and proceeded to reduce the lawnmower man and the four police officers into puddles of goo. That's when my mind broke completely. There's no more time for fucking around, I thought. The chosen one must have faith and act immediately. I tore out of there and back home. I went down to the basement and looked at the stockpile of untreated virus. If radiating it didn't work, and heating it didn't work, and adding more chemicals didn't work, then the obvious answer was to radiate it and heat it and add a shitload of chemicals. That had to work. Or so I thought my completely diluted state. I proceeded to do just that. Not to a small test sample, but to the entire stock. I was, again, convinced that both I had to act immediately and that I couldn't fail. But now, that the virus had worked its way to my brain and eaten away my psychic defenses, I see now that not only was my failure possible, any idiot could have seen it coming. I rented a U-Haul and have been traveling the country for the past week dumping my vaccine into all the major water supplies that I can. It happened at the Colorado River Aqueduct, which supplies water to much of Southern California. I dumped an entire 100 gallon drum of the serum in there, which I calculated was enough to inoculate the entire state of California, let alone the southern part, against the virus. 
assuming that the vaccine would do that, which I thought it would. I had gone three days without sleep and was letting out a yawn when a gust of wind blew some of the serum that I was pouring out back into my open mouth. Of all the strains of virus that I've seen, the variation that I created in my state of megalomania appears to be the very worst. My skin is on fire as purple slime oozes out of it. Bugs and worms are crawling out of every hole in my body, no matter how small. A tentacle has emerged from my throat and is feeling around in the air, hungry. I am, uh, so hungry. And I know that what I'm hungry for, too. Somehow, I'm hungry for people. At first, I was terrified. I was worried that I would explode. I'm still terrified, but the feeling is subsiding. This is who I am now. Part of me is still screaming in protest against this, but the screams are getting choked out. I am becoming a zombie of a kind worse than I have ever imagined possible. And soon, so will you. Not immediately. But as municipal water processing is almost agonizingly slow, but sooner than you think, and all I can do is tell you not to drink the water. I am so, so sorry. And hungry. So, so hungry. Tonight's story is called Zombie Juice. Written by Raven Crow from r slash no sleep. I was a bit of a troublemaker in elementary school. Not as bad as some of the real problem kids, but I definitely used to enjoy pushing my teacher's buttons. Up until fifth grade, I was a regular at the principal's office. Mrs. Kendall straightened me out though. I hadn't taken a step out of line in the past 10 years, because even though I know that Mrs. Kendall is gone now, the memories of how close I came to being a zombie stay with me. Mrs. Kendall was new at the school when I began fifth grade. She was pretty nice, but she was very strict and had little tolerance for wise asses like myself. The first day of class, she put a big poster on the wall with everybody's name on it. There was a picture of a baseball pitcher in the corner, and written across the top in her big curly letters were the words, three strikes and you're out. I don't like to punish people unfairly, so everyone gets the same number of chances, Mrs. Kendall explained, smiling around the room at each of us. Everyone has three chances. If you do something bad, I'm going to put a strike next to your name. You won't be punished until you get three strikes, but don't take your strikes lightly. I don't want any of you to have to find out what happens when you get to three strikes. With that, she began the first day of school getting to know each other activities. I don't think many people took her strike speech very seriously. She was so nice and young. She wasn't exactly intimidating. I remember Noah, the biggest jerk in class, rolling his eyes and flipping her off onto the table. I bet that would have earned him his first strike if she had seen it. Noah earned his first strike soon enough, though. We only made it two weeks into school before Noah decided it would be funny to glue Susan's long ponytail to the back of her chair. To his credit, it was pretty funny. She couldn't get out of the chair, and Mrs. Kendall had to cut her off her hair with scissors. Susan went home early, and when she came in with her hair cut really short the next day, a bunch of us teased her for looking like a boy. Poor Susan. Anyway, that was Noah's first strike. By Halloween, Noah got his third strike. Mrs. Kendall told him he would have to stay after school for his punishment. Noah smirked. Mrs. Kendall didn't realize how much he was getting away with. Any other teacher would have sent him to the principal's office 20 times by now, and all Mrs. Kendall was doing was making him take the late bus. As the rest of us left for the day, I remember seeing Noah sitting at his desk with his head down at pretend penance. The next day, Noah was a zombie. From the first time I got in class in the morning, Noah didn't say a word. He just sat at his desk, jaw slightly agape, staring straight ahead of him. Same as the next day and the day after that, he was gone. Noah was in foster care, and word was his foster family had got spooked by his weird behavior and sent him on his way. That's when the rumors about Mrs. Kendall started. Vincent was really into horror movies, so naturally he was the first to suggest that Noah had been turned into a zombie. If Noah was a zombie, why didn't he eat anyone's brains? Susan argued. Yeah, it was more like he didn't have a brain. However, it was the best explanation we could come up with, so the zombie theory stuck. The bigger question was what Miss Kendall had done to him. 
Max claimed he had seen Mrs. Kendall bite Noah after school. Bull spit, Tommy said. That would mean that Mrs. Kendall was a zombie too. Mrs. Kendall isn't a zombie. She's too smart and pretty, said Andy. Ooh, Andy likes Mrs. Kendall, we all said in chorus. And Andy flushed. I know what happened, Veronica boasted. I saw a big jar of icky green stuff in Mrs. Kendall's fridge. It was zombie juice. I bet she injected it into Noah and turned him into a zombie. This theory also stuck. At recess, we pretended to inject each other with zombie juice, and we all stumbled around the playground, a horde of undead ten-year-olds. A week before Christmas, Andy got his third strike. This was just a few days after I got my second. Most of the kids in the class had at least one strike by now, except for the real goody two-shoes like Susan. Hey Andy, I teased during recess. I bet you're excited to stay after class with Mrs. Kendall. Hey Andy, are you going to make out with her? Said Christian. This generated a chorus of ooh. Andy flushed and stomped away from the rest of us. The next day, Andy was a zombie. We thought the zombie juice was so funny before, but now the humor was gone. None of us had liked Noah much, but Andy was our friend. Now, even though he was still sitting in class with us, Andy was gone. His parents pulled him out of class just a few days before Christmas break. I heard from his best friend Tommy that his parents were going to take him to the doctor. Well, I didn't need a medical degree to tell him that there was something wrong with Andy. Mrs. Kendall had turned him into a zombie, plain and simple. School started up again in January, and with the thrill of Santa, most of us just completely forgotten about our poor old friend, Andy. Classes resumed as normal, and the only person who continued to be gloomy was Tommy. The day I remember for the rest of my life is the day the police came for Mrs. Kendall. We had been back in class for a week when the doctors discovered what was wrong with Andy. We had been just let out for recess when the police approached Mrs. Kendall, who was monitoring us from a bench by the swings. After a brief confrontation, the whole class watched in awe as they cuffed her and led her to the back of the police car. The principal led us inside, where he explained to us that we would be having a substitute teacher for the rest of the year. I learned more from eavesdropping my parents when I got home. After several visits from the neurologist, Andy's parents were informed that the cortical tissue on the prefrontal cortex of his brain had been severed. There were also several gouges penetrating his thalamus, and there was bruising in his right eye socket. That was the day I learned the word lobotomy. After a bit of an investigation, the police obtained a warrant and searched Mrs. Kendall's property. They found an ice pick in the trunk of her car. They arrested her later that day. If it wasn't for the police coming that day, I wouldn't be able to tell you my story. I don't know what happened to Noah, but Andy lives in a group home for the mentally disabled. I used to be a wise ass when I was a kid, but now every time I so much as think of breaking a rule, I picture myself in Andy's place. I constantly think about how close I came to being another one of Mrs. Kendall's zombies. The day the police arrested Mrs. Kendall was the day I had gotten my third strike. I'm not gonna lie, stuff like that really freaks me out. I got five kids and four of them are in school and I, I, I'm I, not gonna pretend like I don't get a little worried about um, the teachers every once in a while, you know what I mean? You, you can only really know someone so well, so stories like that don't <laughs> don't help to make me feel any better about that. But I did enjoy the story. Um, I appreciate the author for writing this, and um, I hope you guys enjoyed it too. So I'll talk to you guys next time, and don't forget to always face your fears. Tonight's story is called "So You're Undead," written by a deleted user on r slash no sleep. Hello and welcome. Since you received this pamphlet, there is a high probability that you are dead. While this may come as a nasty shock at first, we are dedicated to helping you acclimatize to your new undead state. After all, we've all been there. We hope this introduction pamphlet can answer some of your initial questions, and we promise we will be with you every step of the way. So let's get started. Question 1. Why did this happen to me? Sadly, we're not entirely sure why this happens to some people and not others. Unfortunately, the science in that area is lacking due to the lack of willing test subjects. However, from shared experience, 
we can give you some idea of how you ended up this way. Most likely, you have had a hand in your own death. Whether by suicide, drug overdose, or some other dumb stunt, we know the likelihood of you returning as undead rises from unnatural, self-inflicted causes. The good news is that now your death is over and done with, and you come back to us forever! Question 2. What does this mean for me? Obviously, this event will change your life, or unlife, forever. You've probably noticed that some time has passed since you died. It's normal for the process of undying to take a while depending on the damage you sustained. Don't worry, most of yourself will regenerate back to normal as long as you keep yourself healthy and well fed. If you're reading this from your casket, then we're sorry we didn't get to you in time to intervene. Sometimes a family member or a landlord will find the transitioning undead before we do, which usually results in an unfortunate burial. But don't worry, we work with a mortician to make sure a potential undead have their pamphlet in their caskets. Soon enough, our grave robbers will take time out of their busy schedule to also dig you up. We know, we know, grave robbing is a nasty business, but we need to eat too. Until then, just lie back and relax. Remember, at least you weren't cremated. Question 3. What lifestyle changes will I need to make? The good news is that you can retain most of your normal life from before you were undead. Though family and coworkers may take it rough, we have some handy coming out packets that can help you along the way. You will need to make changes in your diet, of course. While you can still eat normal food without causing major harm to your body, your digestive tract won't thank you, however. We recommend a steady diet of fresh organ meat. Despite what you've seen in movies, it doesn't have to be from humans, nor does it have to be from the brain. Our team of grave robbers will helpfully supply you with a month's worth of meat for free to help you while you get back on your feet. Question 4. Am I invincible or immortal? No and yes, we're afraid. You can decay and take injury just like any other unliving thing. Too much injury and you may go into a coma like state we call stasis. You may wake up from it eventually, or not at all. While we say, wake up, you still will mainly be conscious for the entire thing just unable to move, speak, or do much of anything. The good news is that you'll have plenty of time to plan out the rest of your unlife if you wake back up. To stop decay, it is important to continue basic hygiene practices as well as eat a balanced diet of organ meat. Undead or not, your body is your temple after all. Exercise is also good, but be wary of overly vigorous exercises. Your muscles and joints may not move the same as they did, and nobody likes an inverted knee. Now you're probably wondering, where do I go from here? The answer is anywhere you'd like. The sky's the limit. However, we don't recommend flying. The changing air pressure can do some funny things to the undead body. Be warned that not everybody is so accepting of the undead, but that you'll always be accepted by your local undead community and we're dedicated in making these attitudes change in the near future one way or another. There are many more of us than there are of them, after all. But you don't need to worry about that yet. Enjoy your new on life. We look forward to more interaction with you. Your local undead community. Tonight's story is called I Think My Grandmother is Dead, But No One Else Seems to Notice. Written by Kiwi Afternoons from r slash no sleep. I am shaking as I write this. I thought about calling the police, but I haven't figured out if I'm losing my mind or if my entire family has lost theirs. Maybe I will wake up soon, and this will all have been a terrible nightmare. For context, I am an only child and the only grandchild of my last living grandmother. A couple weeks ago, while at work, I received a phone call from my mother informing me that my grandmother had taken a fall in her kitchen. Mom said that my Uncle Lou was with her and already in the ambulance. Paramedics suspected she had a fractured hip and somehow sliced open her foot. She was sedated due to the pain, but was otherwise responsive and fine. I immediately asked if I should meet them at the hospital, but Mom said, No, no. Don't leave work. I'll update you once I know more. So I waited. I love my grandmother, but she's probably the most stubborn woman I've ever met. She has a home remedy for just about anything and loathes seeing doctors so I'm sure she won't be fun to deal with while confined to a hospital bed. It doesn't help that Grandma absolutely refuses to use a walker or cane despite her debilitating age, 
and will not leave her house to live in a nursing home. Six months ago, Uncle Lou moved in to help her out. Not that he said it out loud, but I've always suspected that he did it more for the free rent. With nothing else to do, I sat at work, distracted, and waited for a phone call from my mom with news. That call didn't come through until long after I'd gotten home and was brushing my teeth for bed. Apparently, Grandma was awake now and doing fine. She would need surgery for the broken hip, but they were able to get the laceration on her foot stitched up and bandaged. I asked to speak to her, so Mom held the phone up to my grandma's ear, and I told her I loved her and would see her once she was discharged. The hospital only allowed two visitors, and Mom and Lou refused to leave her side. Hi, honey, Grandma said through the receiver. I'm okay, but they won't let me leave. My mom's voice in the background exasperatedly explained that she needed surgery. So they tell me, Grandma huffed. I'm fine, Anna. Come see me when you get home and we can play cards. I smiled, promised a visit, and said goodbye. She was discharged the following week and sent home. The hip replacement was successful, but she developed a nasty infection on her foot. Between the two ailments, Grandma was confined to her bed. Once she was comfortable at home, Mom gave me the okay to come over, so I made some chicken dumpling soup and sat in the chair beside her while Mom spoon-fed into Grandma's mouth. There you go, Mom. My mom encouraged as Grandma sipped the broth off a spoon. I could tell Grandma was wildly out of it. I had been expecting an earful about having to use a bedpan, but due to the cocktail of narcotics and antibiotics, she merely grumbled in annoyance as Mom's and Lou's constant hovering. For what it was, she seemed in good spirits if not exceptionally tired. After about two hours and two small soup mishaps, I got up to leave. Mom saw me to the door. She'll be fine, Anna, Mom reassured. Lou and I are taking care of everything. Don't worry. I left feeling optimistic that my grandmother would be back to her spitfire self relatively soon. But that visit with the soup was over two weeks ago now. Not long after, Mom took a leave of absence at work and holed up in Grandma's house with Uncle Lou. Each time I called, Mom gave us a new excuse as to why I shouldn't visit. Risk of infection, flu season, fatigue, bowel issues, you name it. At first, I accepted these excuses at face value. They seem legit. But I can't even get Mom to put Grandma on the phone anymore. I made more soup yesterday and dropped it off. But Uncle Lou met me at the door and said it wasn't a good time. But he'd make sure she got it. And we always let her know when you call, he reassured. I noticed there was an intense floral and yet antiseptic scent coming from the doorway. Your mom won't stop cleaning, he explained. Frustrated, I called and complained to my father on my way home. But he defended my mom, like always. She's always been like this, he reminded me. They're extremely close, your mom and grandma. And Lou? Well... This just seems like classic Lou. You know, this is the first time they've really had to face the reality of their mother's age. They're just protective and scared to lose her. I figured he was right, and I hung up the phone, being a little less unsettled. On Grandma's 89th birthday, however, I decided I wasn't going to take no for an answer. I would go over there and give her the present I purchased for her, a new thriller by her favorite author. I arrived at the house in late afternoon and noticed all the blinds were closed. Being that it was a warm spring day, it was common for Grandma to have all her windows open and drapes open, letting in both the sunlight and fresh air. I knocked twice on the front door, but no one came. I knocked again, no answer. I tried the knob, but the door was locked. I paused for a moment, considering that maybe no one was home. Maybe Grandma had a follow-up with a surgeon, but both cars were in the driveway. So I knocked again, louder. The door opened a crack and a foul odor filtered out nearly choking me. Mom, I exclaimed when her face appeared on the other side of the door. What is that smell? Seeing it was only me, she opened the door another inch. The infection's gotten worse, but we're monitoring it. Should I call an ambulance? I asked in a panic, pulling my cell phone from my pocket. No, no, Anna, she quickly reassured me. We have it handled. I stopped by and picked up refills of her antibiotics earlier, and we've been on the phone with her surgeon. 
Relieved, I took a deep breath. The smell was so overpowering. Mom, that smell is ungodly. Why don't you open the windows? We tried, she said, but she got so cold. Mom shrugged and didn't move. Can I come in? I asked, attempting to look over her shoulder in the dim house. I really didn't want to go in the house due to the smell, but if Grandma wasn't doing well, I wanted to see her. I don't think that's a good idea, she murmured. Where's Uncle Lou? I asked. Upstairs in the room. Her voice was reassuring, but the smell turned my insides. Surely a smell like that could only mean bad things. I pushed the door open and Mom protested. Just come back another day when she's feeling better. I promise you that Lou and I have this under control. In the kitchen, the odor was strong but mixed with the smell of bleach. I couldn't tell if this made it better or worse. At least let me see her and give her her birthday present. Mom looked down to see the wrapped gift in my hands inside. Of course, she said. Gosh, I'm sorry. We've just been so preoccupied. I'm sure she'll love it. At that moment, Uncle Lou came trotting down the stairs and smiled at me. Anna! Mom will be so happy you're here. I looked at my mother incredulously. She was staring at her feet now. What was going on? Uncle Lou continued down the hall, and I could hear him as he opened the door to Grandma's bedroom. Mom, you have a visitor for your birthday. The smell of the house was searing my nostrils, but I wasn't going to let Grandma know I was repulsed by it. Mom led me down the hall to Grandma's bedroom, instructing me along the way to put on a brave face. I plastered a smile across my face as I turned the corner into the room. Grandma was sitting up in bed, and Uncle Lou had taken a seat on the mattress beside her. Her body obscured most of the view, but I could see her feet where they stuck out from under the quilt. The toes on her right foot were black, with crumbling toenails and festering sores. The sheets under her heel were stained yellow from dried pus. Lou was prattling onto her, but Grandma didn't respond. Isn't it nice for Anna to come see you on your birthday, Mom? Goodness knows you've been through a lot this month. She has a present for you. He turned expectantly to me, his profile moving just enough to reveal Grandma's form where she sat up against the pillows. I will try to explain the horror I witnessed, but I know words will never do it justice. My stomach flipped and I froze. Grandma's dull, lifeless eyes stared straight ahead at the wall, unblinking and glazed over. Her eyelids were crusty and her jaw hung widely agape with sagging lips, revealing a gray fuzz that had begun to coat her tongue. Uncle Lou patted her leg while Mom hastily pulled the quilt back down over her feet. I barely heard as Lou explained how cold she had been from the infection. He picked up a tissue from the box on the nightstand and began dabbing at the corner of her mouth. She doesn't talk much due to the heavy sedation she's under, he explained. I couldn't tear my eyes away from the pallid, gray skin of Grandma's face and how it was starting to sag in ways that had nothing to do with her age. Flies buzzed overhead and Mom picked up the fly swatter and began swatting wildly at them. Goddamn flies, she mumbled. They won't leave her alone. One of the flies circled Grandma's face and landed in her open maw. Uncle Lou merely scooted away. She's been sleeping sitting up like this for the past week or so, Mom explained, patting Grandma's low-covered feet. The pain is just too much for her to lay down. We tried, but her muscles spasm and she can't move. My knees were shaking and I could all but back out of the room, reaching for and pressing myself against the opposite wall. Vomit crept up the back of my throat. It's okay, Anna, Uncle Lou said from inside the room. I know it's hard to see her in such a state, but that's why your mom and I are here to take care of her. We agree we wouldn't let her go back to that hospital. They've already messed up so much of her care. You saw her foot and what the doctors did to it. How a hospital could let gangrene go unnoticed is beyond me, Mom agreed. We've been sponge bathing her regularly, airing her feet, and changing the bandages frequently. It seems to be helping, right mom? She asked, squeezing grandma's ankle. I tried to put my head between my knees, but the smell was so overpowering. Mom stepped out in the hallway and touched my shoulder. I recoiled. Oh Anna, I I'm so sorry. This is why I didn't want you to come over. The gangrene smell is hard to tolerate, and I didn't want you to have to see her like this. Not knowing what else to do, I pulled her into the kitchen and said in the most steady voice, Mom, why didn't you tell me my grandma had passed? Mom's face didn't change. 
She just looked at me. What are you talking about, Anna? She's right there. You saw her. Yes, I did see her, I agreed, pointing at the bedroom down the hall where the smell was so strong that I was close to passing out. But Grandma is dead, Mom. You, you know that, right? She has very obviously passed away. Mom's eyebrows narrowed and she pursed her lips. Listen, Anna, I get that this is hard for you. Hell, it's hard for all of us. But if you're saying that just to hurt me, it's not going to work. Stop being a brat. Your father is on his way over here with a birthday cake. The room began to spin and I needed to get out of that house immediately. I tossed the present on the kitchen table and grabbed my bag, fleeing out the kitchen door and into the car where I took deep gulps of fresh air. I could see Mom at the large bay window, looking out at me. She looked angry and upset, but quickly turned and walked away. I pounded the steering wheel, yelling obscenities. Other than an open casket funeral, I had never seen a dead body before, let alone one that had been clearly dead for weeks. But Grandma was undoubtedly dead, and my mother and uncle were staying in that house with that corpse, washing it, feeding it, and talking to it like nothing had changed. I threw open the car door and vomited all over Grandma's neglected shrubs. By the time the dry heaves kicked in, Dad's car pulled in the driveway. Hey, sweetheart, he said as he opened his car door, seeing me kneeling in the grass. Are you all right? Your mom called and told me you were quite upset. Dad, she's dead, I choked out, pointing at the house. Who's dead? He asked, his voice worried. Grandma, I shouted. Grandma's dead. Mom and Lou, they're just sitting in there with her body. Anna, calm down. Your mom mentioned you were in hysterics and talking nonsense. Talking nonsense? What are you talking about? I choked out. Go look, Dad. I swear. You'll see. She's dead and Mom and Lou have lost their minds. All right, he said, holding up his arms in surrender. Let me grab the cake and I'll go inside and see what's going on. Just stay here, okay? I collapsed back in the front seat of my car, blasting the AC in an attempt to flush the smell of rotten flesh out of my nose. It felt like an hour before the front door opened again, and Dad calmly walked over my driver's head window. Hi, Anna Bear, he said cautiously. Did you see her, Dad? You saw her, right? Shh, Anna, he said, placing his hand on my shoulder. Calm down. Yes, I saw her, and she's very sick, but otherwise alive. Your mom and Lou are taking good care of her. What? I screamed. Come inside, Dad said, going for the door handle. I quickly locked the door. Dad threw up his hands in frustration. Come, just come inside, Anna. Uncle Lou is getting Grandma into her wheelchair, and we're all going to have some cake. He glanced up at the front window of the house. Ah, see, there she is. I glanced up to see my grandmother's face at the window. Her dead eyes looked blankly over at the front yard. Rigor mortis had made it so her body couldn't sit in the wheelchair just right. Even from a distance and through a pane of glass, I could see death in her eyes and the shock and gape of her mouth. I gagged. Her face looked even more twisted now, as if she'd taken her last breath in a tremendous amount of pain. But what made me scream in abject horror was that her cloudy pupils seemed to turn ever so slightly towards me. I threw the car into drive and sped out of the driveway, ignoring the shouts of my father and Uncle Lou bursting out the front door. I didn't dare go home, where I was sure my father would follow. Were they right? Was she actually alive? It's not like I checked for her pulse or air in her lungs before I took off. I didn't touch her at all. Could it be me then? Was I the one having the nervous breakdown? I don't know what to do now. I'm absolutely terrified. Worst of all, when I close my eyes, all I see is my grandmother's rotting face. Oh my God. So I picked this story this week mainly because it was such an interesting idea to me. Um, I, I read through a ton of these no sleep stories and uh, I've been doing a bunch of zombie stories lately, and I just wanted something a, a, a little different. I absolutely loved my grandmother, and, and as twisted as it sounds, I think she would have liked this story before she passed away, too. And uh, I just, I thought you guys might enjoy it, too. I, I, I thought it was a great idea, the whole idea that maybe you're losing your mind, or your, your grandma is somehow still alive, or... <sighs> yeah, it's just, <clears throat> it's a real messed up story. It's, again, like the one from last week, where... It's spooky because it's it could actually happen. You know, some people look really, really messed up when they're half dead, you know, and maybe it's just such a 
traumatic experience that you just can't wrap your brain around it. But having that be said, I hope you guys enjoyed the stories. Uh, thanks again to the author. And uh, remember to always face your fears. See you next time, guys. Tonight's story is called I Was a Security Guard for a Store That Doesn't Exist and What I Saw Will Haunt Me Forever. Written by Bad Andy the Red on r slash no sleep. Two weeks of work for almost six grand. How could I refuse? That was what I thought when I was looking at that bizarre listing in an email I had received. It said, Temporary night security needed for local antique and clothes shop. Two-week contract, $6,000 upon completion of contract. I was shocked that it was still available when I had contacted the store. The owner had answered the call and had told me I was hired on the phone without even asking for any references or my resume. I had never actually worked security before, but I was on the larger side and trained in self-defense and knew how to aim a flashlight, so I figured I could give it a shot. I had just been laid off my previous job due to downsizing, and even though security work is not my specialty, I told myself I would make it work for the sort of money. Part of me was thinking, even back then, what the catch was to be getting that much more than minimum wage. But beggars can't be choosers. I left with plenty of time to find the place and arrive without being late. It was a strange little store down a disturbingly barren stretch of road, almost two miles from the nearest shopping center. Kind of a bad place if you're trying to sell anything. But I guess it doesn't matter as long as the money is good. I pulled into a dingy parking lot and saw a faded little sign that indicated the business was known as the Proud Tailor. They apparently sold antiques and old apparel. They must have made a solid business to pay this much for security. I wondered why it was so much and why it was only two weeks though. I guess that it didn't matter and I got out of my car taking my flashlight since it was already very dark and there was li very little in the way of parking lot lights out here. As I walked through the lot, I almost walked right past the entrance. I had to turn back and do a double take. It was odd, but it almost seemed, when looking at it from the right angle, to sort of look blurry, almost like a heat mirage. I was interrupted from the strange days when another car arrived in the lot. I walked over to it and met my contract, Mr. Jaspin. He regarded me curtly, thanked me for being on time, then immediately, without skipping a beat, launched into a tirade of rules for this job that I felt I would need a notebook just to write down and keep track of. Excuse me, sir. What? Was the first of many interjections I had made when hearing the bizarre task I was now expected to perform at my new, albeit temporary, place of employment. Yes, I know it sounds weird, but the owner is a pretty weird man, honestly. But he pays well considering. He put on his best appealing smile and continued with the weird list. I listened with increasing incredulity to this man, who besides the owner on the phone, was the only contact I had made thus far when taking this job. After he had gone over six of them, I made a note list on my phone and had him repeat several of them. Oh my, he said in a somewhat condescending tone. I hope your observation skills are better than your listening ones. Very well, once more here are the rules. I was annoyed by the insult, but ready with my note app this time. Hours of security would be from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. No taking breaks in the store. Breaks must occur in the external security booth. Lunch break must occur at 2.30 a.m. and must not occur in the building. No touching any of the merchandise. Especially no touching of displays. At 1 a.m. precisely, the customer bathroom must be inspected and cleaned if necessary. If there is trash in the receptacle near the back room, please dispose of it in the locking dumpster outside. No staring at any displays. Back room is off limits except in emergency situations. Trespassers are to be detained and given to our contact with the police if to be called to arrange removal. Is that all? I thought there was a lot. I said half smirking and nervously laughing a bit after Mr. Jasmine had finished speaking. I gave up on humor when he glowered back at me and decided I should just listen. His friendly demeanor was broken and he flatly stated that the rules are the rules for a reason. Keep to them and there will be no problems. If you do not follow them, then we cannot guarantee your si He paused mid-sentence and corrected. 
cannot guarantee full compensation for the services rendered. Please abide by them at all times. He humorously bid me good night and left, leaving me alone in the parking lot without even having a proper tour of the inside of the building I would be guarding or any other type of orientation beyond the meticulous listing of rules. This was really weird, and I found myself wishing I had found something a bit more run-of-the-mill and less bizarre, even if it paid less. But I reminded myself of how much money it would be, and I decided to try and ignore the nagging feelings in my gut and get to work, whatever that looked like here. I took a quick stroll around the perimeter of the store. It was not too big, but something about it made walking near and around it feel like it took longer than it should have. It felt like with how small it appeared from the parking lot, I could be around the building in two minutes flat, but somehow it took me five minutes to go back to the front where I had started. I brushed it off as maybe just being distracted by the new scenery and the barren surroundings, perhaps as well the unnerving darkness and quiet surrounding the place. At least without light pollution, the moon was visible, but it was faint and everything was still very dark. I decided to head to the security booth and get set up. The security room, if you could even call it a room and not just a repurposed tool shed, was very dingy. At least it was well lit, since it was so small the single overhead light bulb made it so. There was a small CCTV which appeared to be connected to three security cameras positioned in the store. I went to switch them on, but they appeared to be dead. I saw a note attached below one of the monitors indicating that the cameras were out of service and that a manual inspection of the building would be required at one hour intervals. There was an antique looking brass key that I figured must be the store's key. I pocketed it and sat down. I was not sure what to do in the booth out here without working cameras. Just watch for people trying to break in around the lot, maybe? I figured I would patrol the perimeter every 30 minutes to get some steps in and see if anything was happening. In between checking in on the store and patrolling inside per the hour mandate mentioned on the note, I brought a few books to read while waiting between patrols and tried to get comfortable in the hard steel chair I had been given to sit on at the security station. I thought that maybe they could afford to pay so much for the security job because they didn't spend a dime on any amenities for actual security personnel. After an uneventful hour of sitting in the security shack, I started to call it, since anything more formal would be an insult to actual security stations. I realized I had to get up and head inside to do my rounds for the first time. I grabbed my flashlight and walked to the front door again. I saw the strange distortion near it once more and wondered what in the world could cause that hazy effect. I hoped it was not a gas leak or something. I fumbled with the odd key for a moment and the door creaked open on loud hinges. It was freezing inside, somehow even colder than outside. I didn't think that was possible unless they had some sort of air conditioner on, which would be bizarre since it was winter. I was wishing I had brought a warmer coat, but I had a job to do, so I pushed inside the frigid air and into the store proper. There was minimal lighting inside when it was closed. I was glad I had my flashlight, but still wished there was at least a few overhead lights I could turn on while patrolling. Every switch I had found appeared to be shut down, and no additional lights could be turned on. The main floor was not too large, and I decided to do a circuit around the floor, and then once through the middle and call it good. I took a small path to the right and passed some shelves with musty books and library paraphernalia. Round in the corner I saw some very disturbing looking mannequins near the back wall. They were all wearing old fashioned and ornate Victorian era clothing. The faces and general air of the looming figures was very creepy, and I didn't like how as I walked the heads always seemed to be facing me, but I figured I was just a bit creeped out by the strangeness of the store and would get used to it on subsequent patrols. I saw near the mannequin wall a door and a restroom sign and knew that was on my checklist. I thought I might clean it now, but the rules said it to check at 1am exactly, so I decided to abide by them and check back then. I kept walking, passing by racks of old clothes and wall displays of tools off, relics and even some weapons. I didn't see anything out of the order on my rounds, for the first time, at least whatever order looks like from this weird store. I looked back briefly into the freezing store and closed and locked the door again and returned to the security shack. I went through the motions several more times uneventfully. I had taken my break and just read straight through it. I thought about the break rule and I didn't know who would be crazy enough to want to take a break or lunch in that musty refrigerator with those creepy mannequins watching you. 
At 1 a.m. I checked the bathroom. It looked unused and fortunately there was no mess to clean up. I was about to leave when I saw a faint red stain near the base of the sink. I turned on the water and used some antibacterial wipes to clean it away. I didn't know what it was, but it may have been blood, so best to take precautions. When leaving, the creepy mannequins caught my eye again, and I could have sworn I saw an odd red stain on the coat of one that was not there before. I took the garbage from the bathroom, and as I was heading out, I remembered I had to check the other garbage and look for the back room door to see a portable garbage can. It was very heavy, and I wondered how they could produce this much waste in a day. I took both garbages out back and took them out to a sealed dumpster. Inside the heavy can was a triple sealed bag. It smelled pretty bad and I didn't even want to know what kind of funky shit was in it. I pulled the lever on the dumpster to lower the tray and put the bulging garbage bag on, along with the smaller bathroom garbage. I pushed it back into place and heard a heavy thumping fall and a kind of an eerie squishing sound. I don't even want to know, I thought to myself yet again that night. I returned to the security shack and sat back down. The rest of the first night was uneventful, and I was hoping it would stay that way for the next couple weeks and I could just get my payday and not spend any more time in that bizarre place. The next two days were fairly uneventful, though the mundane nature of those two nights meant that when the hammer fell, I was too comfortable and way less prepared for the insanity of the next night. It was Thursday, my fourth night, and I had arrived a little late when I started my patrol. I had found broken glass out near the back where the dumpster was. I thought it was odd, but I was a bit more concerned when I noticed that amidst the glass was what looked like clothing fabric and traces of blood. This set me on edge, but I couldn't find anything else nearby, so I reluctantly returned to the security shack. I wish I had been given a contact number besides the police line that, according to the rules, was meant only for when we needed to detain trespassers. I thought maybe I should make a note of it and ask Mr. Jasmine when I spoke with him next. It was time to go into the store and do my rounds. It was bitterly cold as usual and I saw as I was walking around that some displays had been knocked over and there was a bit of a mess in the aisles. It was strange that whoever had closed and not cleaned up. I was told to not even touch the merchandise, so I didn't know if I should put it back or not. I decided in this case that it might be okay. I was not going to steal anything after all, so I bent down and started collecting a few articles of clothing and placing them back on the clothes rack. When I finished, I looked around and was shocked when the mannequins all seemed to be looking directly at me. Not just the ones on the wall, who were already facing the center, but the other ones as well. I was getting a bit freaked out and I started to hear a high-pitched buzzing noise as well. I resolved to finish up and get out of there as quickly as I could. Then I realized my misfortune, I had to use the bathroom just then. I ran away from the staring eyes of the mannequins and used the customer restroom where I always did, since the security shack had no facilities. When I finished, I decided to just take the trash out now and clean up the bathroom. It was only 11 p.m., but I figured I had already touched the merchandise, so why not get the bathroom done while I was at it? One less thing to worry about. The garbage by the bathroom seemed to be empty, so I left and returned to the security shack. At 1 a.m., I went back inside to my rounds again, but something was off. The building was slightly warmer, and I noticed that a rather foul smell was coming from the bathroom. I had just cleaned there, I thought. How was this possible? I opened the door, and somehow the garbage was full of strips of bloody cloth and surgical needles, the sort of thing normally needed to be disposed of in a biohazard crate. There were other less obvious things in the bin, and after my disgust that the smell died down, I paused and became very concerned. I had already cleaned this out. How the hell did it get here now? Was someone else here? I suppressed a shudder and decided to step outside as I was leaving. I heard the smash of glass and it sounded like it was coming from outside. I ran outside and saw a figure sprinting around the corner of the store. I dropped the bag of garbage and shouted, STOP! as loud as I could, but they raced on and I gave chase. They were moving so quickly I knew I couldn't catch up. Then they slipped on something and fell. As I caught up, I saw that it turned out to be a small pool of some liquid. I raced over to the prone form and found a young man. He was panting hard and what appeared to be blood was all over him. I didn't know if he was possibly a threat. He looked more scared than dangerous. But if he was desperate to get away, he could be unsafe, so I approached slowly. He was a small and fairly young, maybe 18 or 19. 
had no remarkable features besides a faint scar over his right eyebrow and some sort of tree branch tattoo on his right arm. Holy shit, dude, you scared the hell out of me. What are you doing? I asked him out of breath and trying to regain my composure. You, he started. You have to help me, he blurted out, still panic-stricken about something. I didn't know what he was doing. All I heard was a bl glass breaking somewhere, and he was there taking off running. His behavior did not seem to indicate vandalism, but why was he here? Alright, slow down and tell me what happened. Who are you, and what were you doing here? I asked him as calmly as I could to try and de-escalate the situation. Okay, okay, just... Took a deep breath. <sighs> just listen, I need to find my sister. She was at the store, or whatever this place is, when it was somewhere else and she went missing. I listened to him as panic and frenzy started welling up in his voice again. I, I don't know how this place is here or why it is, but I need to find her before it is gone again. It looked like he was speaking sincerely, even though I couldn't make sense of it. What do you mean before it's gone again? I asked. This place, this weird store, it was in a shopping mall, this, this exact store. You mean they moved here? I tried to clarify. No, this exact store! He shouted back to me. Look, friend, I don't know what you think is going on here, but I assure you it is just here. Your sister's not here. No one else is even here right now, and it looks like you are in a bad way. I said as I looked at his haggard appearance and the blood staining his clothes. I tried to calm him down and managed to take him to the security shack. I told him I would call the police line I was given and that they could help him find his sister. I didn't know if he was delusional or schizophrenic or something, but I figured I needed help in this case, so I finally called the number. There was a substantial wait considering it was supposed to be a police line, and someone finally answered. Stanton speaking, was the terse and fairly agitated voice on the other line. I explained the situation to him, and I thought I heard an annoyed groan suppressed on the other line, filled by a quick, I'll be right over, hold him and wait, and the line went dead. Real cherry fellow, I muttered sarcastically to myself. The young man who still hadn't given me his name was sitting on the floor in the shack, not taking his eyes off the main building. He wouldn't speak anymore, but the panicked look never left his eyes. I started to second guess myself and thought maybe something was in there. I did not know for certain everything that was in that place, like the back room for example. Then I thought of the weird garbage I saw after I had already cleaned it. I tried to break the awkward silence and asked him about the tattoo he had. That's cool. What's that supposed to be? I asked him. He paused as if considering if he should answer then he finally responded and said, It's a hazel branch. My sister and I each have one in honor of our mother who passed away. We waited for a little over an hour. I was wondering if the officer was going to show up and consider calling the normal emergency services, but I didn't want to get in trouble if I broke the rules. I needed the money. It was almost my lunchtime, and I was getting hungry and impatient. I was about to call again when I heard a blood-curdling scream from what sounded like inside the store. Before I knew what was going on, the man stood up and rushed and sprinted to the main door, taking the keys with him. He knocked me out of the chair, and I fell hard to the ground. I didn't have time to stop him. He was in the store before I could get up and chase after him. Once I got to my feet and rushed to the building, I saw the lights of the patrol car approach. A large man stepped out. I didn't recognize the uniform. Something seemed off. I realized even though he wore a police uniform, there were not any identifying features on it, besides just looking like a generic police outfit. His car too, though it had lights did not appear to be city, state, or county sheriff. I didn't know what was up right then I didn't care. We needed to see what was going on inside with that scream with the young man. I explained the situation and the man, Stanton as he said his name, looked at his watch and grimaced. Oh shit, why did it have to be now? He looked concerned and I was about to ask him what was wrong when he put a hand up and told me in no uncertain terms. Thank you for the heads up. I'll handle it from here. I was confused. Wait, handle it? Don't you need help in there? What are we going to do? I asked him, trying to hide my nervousness. No, sir, he responded curtly. It is 2.30 a.m. and you have a lunch to attend. In fact, for that matter, considering the situation, why don't you take the rest of the night off? It's not going to be safe in there and the professionals will handle it. Wait, what? What do you mean? I stammered out. 
Someone is in there and possibly someone else who needs help or someone who or something dangerous. Don't you need backup or something? I asked, feeling the tension increase. He paused for a moment and looked very threatened as he shifted his gaze back toward me. I already called back up. They will be here shortly. Thank you again, but you have to leave now. But don't you at least need like a statement or something? I asked, not wanting to be left out of whatever was happening, since something didn't feel right. I just took your statement. Now, I'm afraid I'm going to have to insist. As he finished the statement, he rested his hand on the grip of his firearm, and I took the hint from there. This was all felt wrong. I did not want to leave, but he had made it clear I didn't have much of a choice. I considered calling the emergency line and checking if this guy was legit, but as I walked away I noticed my phone was missing. I looked back and the man's stamp was speaking on his own phone. I couldn't hear anything, but I made out a few words. Dangerous and handled. I got to my car and was idling for a bit when I heard a loudspeaker yell out that I needed to go now. This is a potential crime scene. Clear off or you would be prosecuted. Stanton called out from the door holding a megaphone. I took one last look behind and I left. I still feel guilty about that decision. I didn't know what happened, but I all felt wrong. Maybe I could have done more. I did not hear anything in the news about what happened the next day and was eager for any information. I considered calling Stanton to see what would happen but I decided against it and called the line I had used to inquire about the position, and the line was disconnected now. What the hell was going on, I wondered. I arrived a little early just to see what happened. I thought the store hour should have seen it open right now, but it was locked up and no one around. I wondered if they had been open at all today. I checked the security shack and, as expected, no note, no nothing, no indication of anything that had happened. I stepped inside for my first patrol, and did not see anything amiss. The garbage was very full, but besides that, everything seemed spotless. I couldn't find anything wrong. No signs of a struggle. No one around. What the hell happened here? I said softly to myself. I kept walking and I heard a crunch under my foot. I thought I had stepped on glass, but I was shocked and somehow horrified when I saw I had stepped on and crushed my own cell phone. I must have dropped it in here, but I couldn't remember doing it. Besides having a cracked screen now, it looked like it was covered in a dark, brownish liquid. I shuddered when I brought it close to my face and I smelled the metallic tinge of blood. What the hell? I looked around a bit more and couldn't find any other evidence of last night's events. I had a bad feeling something very wrong had happened here. At 1am, I returned and checked the bathroom. It was spotless and no garbage was in there. I left, but I noticed the chill in the building had returned, and I swear I had seen a light from underneath the backroom door. Only one more work week. You can do this just one more week, I muttered to myself like a mantra and left. Surprisingly, the next four days and I have anything strange in the store for me. Yet, because of how uneventful and mundane they were, it gave me a growing sense of dread that something was going to happen. Yet, day after day of tense anticipation, there was nothing. On the last day of all days, I saw the thing that I can never unsee. The thing that leads me to writing this account, trying to find any trace of that nightmarish hellscape masquerading as a quaint clothes store. It seemed like the last couple of nights at first, and I was grateful since after that night, I would be able to get my paycheck and be done with this sketchy store. On my first patrol, I took the garbage bin by the back room out since it was almost overflowing. It was incredibly heavy, and as I pulled it along, I must have hit a large rock with a wheel, and it went tumbling over. The very same rock or friction or whatever force in play must have succeeded in cutting open one of the normally sealed bags, and when it splayed its contents out, I thought I was going to vomit, pass out, or scream. Instead, I just looked on in horrified confusion as there was what appeared to be pounds of bloody rags, rusted surgical equipment, and some strips of unidentified flesh. The gory bag was inexplicable, My mind raced to try and find some explanation for the grisly contents of the bag. Was someone here doing illegal surgeries or something? The hell is this? I thought of Mr. Jasmine and his creepy smile. The owner had spoken with me on the phone, but never met in person, and the weird police officer, if he really was one. I felt panic sinking in, and how I was involving in whatever the mess was, trying to help them guard whatever this place really was. 
I had not thought to arrive too early on any day except one to check for sure. But when I had, I didn't see any employees here, much less any customers. Hell, I had never even seen this store open, if it really was a store. I was wondering if I was even going to get paid, or if something bad might happen to me. I left the gruesome bag where it was. I was not going to put my hands on any potential evidence. But I realized in horror as I returned to the security shack that I had indeed just done that. Now could I really just tell someone else? No one else was here. Just me and a bag of bloody evidence of something having happened. If something illegal was happening, how could I prove I was not involved? It's been just me for two weeks. I thought of the young man too. The intruder a few nights ago. I wish I knew what they had done to him. There were too many bad things that could have happened, and I felt sick of the implications of all of them. I felt guilt too. Yet I did not know what I could do now, so I resolved to just finish the night and hopefully get paid, and then maybe put in an anonymous report when I was done with these people. I sat and brooded and became more and more paranoid as the night went on. I did not do my rounds from the store since I had no wish to pass that horrifying bag of organic detritus again. I decided near the end of the night to go into the store one more time and break one of the rules. I had to know. I had to know if someone was in the back room. Was there someone there the whole time at night? Were they responsible for the strange events that had occurred? At 5 a.m. on my last patrol, I summoned the courage to do it. I went inside and it felt even colder than it had on previous nights. I slowly approached the back room door and bent down to see if I saw a light on the other side. My suspicion was confirmed. There was a faint glow. I paused briefly, took a deep breath, grasped the handle and slowly turned it. It was unlocked. The smell was awful and I instinctively recoiled before going in. How had I not smelled this on the patrol in the store? I had no idea how it could be this bad and not smell through the door. Unless this was recent? I went into the nauseous miasma, covering my whole face as I did so. There was a bright lamp in the corner by the door that had been illuminated in the area and there were shelves of boxes and various office-like debris around. The back room stretched further down a small hall to the left of the door, and I followed it. This room was so well lit, so I pulled my flashlight back out and switched it on and almost dropped it and screamed. The light as soon as it was switched on was shining on two hideous mannequins, sitting on what looked like some sort of workbench. They were both sitting upright and staring straight forward as it watching the back room door for anyone who came in. I let out an exhale as I tried to calm down, realizing it was just more mannequins and regretting the action I did since it meant I had inhaled more of the horrible air back here. Against better judgment, I stepped forward cautiously to get a better look. The faces of them were horribly lifelike and something about it was morbidly mesmerizing. I leaned forward to get a look at one of the left wearing a dark, sleeveless jacket that looked fancy and expensive. The face was hideous and somehow it looked like they designed it to be in pain or some other less describable motion. The surface looked so realistic as well. It almost looked like it had human skin. Despite the awful appearance, something looked weirdly familiar, and I noticed an old-looking scar above the eyebrow of the thing. How would a mannequin have a scar? I was puzzled. I felt a rising sense of fear as I looked at the lifelike thing and reached out and touched the hand and my blood ran cold. I felt the hand and it felt warm. I could feel small hairs as well on the surface of the skin and my mind couldn't handle what happened next. I looked further up the arm and turned it over to see the forearm, a small tattoo of what I recognized as a hazel branch. I remembered trying to scream, but only a strangled gasp escaped my mouth. I looked at the female mannequin to the right and saw on its left arm the same tattoo. My mind couldn't reconcile the horrifying truth of the situation, and then, whether it was the breathing in of the foul odor or the disguising core of what I knew, to be the human bodies turned into these display cases of perversion. I vomited on the floor and nearly toppled over. I stood there, doubled over, panting and retching as I finally regained a bit of composure. It was then that the crowning horror occurred. I still don't know to this day if it really happened, or my disturbed mind just conjured it from the shock of the situation, and the memory of speaking to that young man who had broken in that night, looking for his sister. But as I stood slowly back up, it was a splitting, tearing sound like flesh and muscles breaking stitches, and I heard a wheezing, croaking voice mumble the words, Join us! All semblance of sanity at that moment snapped, and I fled the store, grabbed my stuff from the security shack, and drove as fast as I could, 
laughing like a lunatic as the impossibility of the situation. I didn't want to be implicated in this situation, so I made an anonymous call to the authorities about what I suspected was some sort of murder, body mutilation, or organ harvesting operation. I did not know if the owner, whoever he might be, would try and cover it all up, but I really was not expecting what I heard when I tried to follow up the next day. I was chastised for making a false report and was warned about wasting police time and effort, and how they did not appreciate being sent out to the middle of nowhere for serious crime allegations. I didn't understand, and I asked what they meant. Apparently they had been an investigation and nothing turned up. Not because of a cover-up, because nothing was there to investigate. There was no store, no business registered at that location. Apparently not even a building there, just an empty patch of land. I couldn't believe it. It was impossible. I decided to drive out there and check myself, to complete shock. Sure enough, everything was gone. Not just the store, but the sign, the dumpsters, and the security shack. Everything. It is as if it had never existed. How could they remove the entire store in one night and make it look like it never was here? My mind was grasping at rational solutions, but I couldn't conjure any. I tried calling the number I had called to inquire about the job again, but it was still disconnected. I double-checked the email I had received the job listing from, and somehow it had vanished as well. I even looked online for the business, and all I found when looking for the proud tailor were some online shops that sold generic clothes. No odd Victorian-style clothes shops of that name in the city. This state, or even this country. Nothing. What could I do? No trace was left to investigate. No one would be able to find out who owned or operated this nightmare building. There would be no closure for whoever those victims were. As far as the world seemed concerned, the store didn't exist. I started darting my own sanity over the next few weeks. I wondered if somehow all this time it had been some sort of hallucination or terrible lucid dream or more like a nightmare. I couldn't sleep for the last few days, so I started writing down the events as I remembered them, whether they really happened or not. However, I received something today that gave my answer, and I wish to God I had, because what I received is proof that all this happened, and I don't think I can bear the thought of those monsters still existing out there somewhere in the world wherever they went. What I received was a small manila envelope in the mail. It had no return address indicated on the front, but it was addressed to me, and when I opened it, I couldn't believe what I saw. It was $6,000 in cash. Many of the bills looked tinged by a reddish-brown substance and a small note simply saying, Thank you for your services. Ugh. Um, oh. I don't know why that story reminds me of, oh, this one, sto this one movie where they basically they go to this town where there's like this wax museum thing. And uh, this dude literally like covers people in wax, melts their bodies, and like just turns them to wax sculptures. Like I can't even remember what the hell. It's. I think it's like Wax Museum or House of Wax or something like that. It was fucked up. This, this is the story that made me think of that. Um, but I hope you enjoyed the story. This was a really long one. I screwed up and tried to read this like at like 11:30 at night on a work day, <laughs> so I'm like out of my mind, tired. <laughs> But I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. The story is great. I, the first time I read it was awesome. I read it when I was getting my tires swapped out. So um, I hope you liked the story. I liked it a lot. Thank you to the author for letting me read it. And don't forget to always face your fears. <laughs>